Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about renal tubular acidosis. If you have trouble in understanding and remembering RTAs, you are not the only one. Most textbooks have very detailed description, which are very dense, hard to follow and more difficult to remember. I did not find any YouTube videos on this topic that would explain these concepts in a way that's easy to understand and apply it clinically. Most of them will give a table similar to this one to differentiate one RTAs from other. But personally, I don't think I can remember tables like these. We tend to remember more if we know what the underlying pathophysiological problem is rather than just remembering the symptoms and diagnostic criteria. So in this case, we'll approach this in a different way. We'll go three steps. First steps, we'll learn how kidneys handle acid. Next step, we'll see where things can go wrong. And once you know step one and two, you should be able to figure out signs and symptoms of RTAs diagnostic workup and treatments. So how do kidneys handle acids? Well, there are two parts to this. First thing is loss of alkali. Remember that sodium bicarb is easily filtered. So you'll be losing around 4000 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb every day. However, the kidneys are really great at reabsorbing all this back. Most of it happens in proximal convoluted tubules and the rest of them in ascending loop of Henle and distal convoluted tubule. The second thing is production of acid. And if you remember, these are non-volatile acids that are produced from your food and your metabolism. And to get rid of this, your body has two mechanisms. First, it excretes hydrogen ions as ammonium ion. The ammonia needed for this purposes is derived from amino acid glutamine. And this is secreted in your proximal convoluted tubule, but the final ammonia trapping happens in your collecting ducts. You can excrete hydrogen ion with urinary buffers such as phosphoric acid, creatinine, sulfate, urate, etc. These are also called titratable acids. So your net acid excretion is nothing but amount of acid excreted as ammonia plus amount of acid excreted as titratable acid and you subtract the amount of bicarb that you lose through urine. This is a rough diagram showing you how various bicarb, hydrogen ions and ammonia are handled in the kidneys. And out of these, only three of these are important. First one is your problem in your absorption of bicarb in proximal convoluted tubule, also known as proximal RTA or type 2. Inability to secrete hydrogen ions in DCT and that's your distal RTA, that's type 1. And finally, your aldosterone resistance, that's your RTA type 4. RTA type 3 is a combination of proximal and distal RTAs. Proximal RTA is inability to absorb bicarb in proximal convoluted tubule. And when this happens, a lot of your bicarb and sodium ions are going to reach distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. And the body is going to rev up this absorption the best it can. However, you will still lose quite a bit of bicarb in the urine and your serum bicarb will therefore fall. In a normal person, the response for metabolic acidosis will be making an acidic urine. But in these cases, since you're losing bicarb, your urine pH will be relatively alkaline. Usually the pH is more than 5.3. However, in this case, the urine pH will be variable. And let's see this in a little bit more detail. This is a cartoon to help you understand why this happens. You have your plasma bicarb in this tank and this tap represents your kidneys and there are two ways your bicarb is getting absorbed mostly through your PCT and somewhat from your ascending loop and DCT and we know that in type 2 RTA PCTs don't work so you'll have loss of bicarb in the urine and your urine will be alkaline so your bicarb level in plasma is going to drop and it will stabilize at a level where your ascending loop of Henle and DCT can handle at this point, your kidneys might be able to make your urine more acidic. So your urine pH is variable and depends upon how much serum bicarb is. Say for example, you give these patient bicarb tablets and build up your plasma bicarb. You're going to lose all this bicarb back in urine and your urine will be alkaline again. And again, once you stop giving them, it will settle down to that level, which is handled by your ascending loop and DCT. Knowing this fact can help you diagnose proximal RTA. You can do a sodium bicarb load and check fractional excretion of bicarbonate. And if this is more than 20%, you are possibly dealing with type 2 RTA. This also helps understand why these guys need 
a lot of bike up supplementation because as you keep on giving them bike up they'll keep on losing it so in proximal rta it's always a catching game you have to just keep on giving them sodium bike up so that they don't get problem from chronic acidosis so let's look at the next thing that happens since you got a lot of sodium bicarb load in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, you have osmotic diuresis. So that you do not form any renal stones in these places. Other thing is your phosphate and magnesium, which are completely GFR regulated. You start losing quite a lot of them. Since you have a lot of sodium reaching your distal convoluted tubule and proximal collecting duct, your aldosterone mechanism is stimulated and you exchange your sodium for potassium and you lose a lot of potassium in the urine, so resulting in hypokalemia. One good thing in proximal RTA is your ammonia secretions are okay. Other fact is your hypokalemia stimulates more ammonia secretions in your PCT and therefore your excretion of non-volatile acid is maintained. So this gives you a urine osmolar gap more than 150. So the clinical features you can figure out will be all related to osmotic diuresis. So these patients will be hypokalemic, hypercalcemic, hypomagnesemic, hypophosphatemic, and low uric and low citrate levels. The serum bicarb will be 12 to 20. I would understand that once the osmotic diuresis decreases, once your bicarb reaches lower number, say around 12 or 14, these numbers will remain stable after that. What are the causes of type 2 RTA? Problem with your sodium bicarb exchanger in your proximal coronary tubule results in Fanconi syndrome. Medications like ephosphamide can sometimes lead to this channel dysfunction. However, the commonest thing that you will encounter in your clinical life will be carbonic anhydrase inhibitor such as estazolamide and topramate. Know that carbonic anhydrase is also involved in your distal coronary tubule for hydrogen secretion, so that's going to be affected as well. Patients with multiple myeloma and Wilson's disease can have similar problem. Patients with multiple myeloma have a lot of light chains that are filtered and these are reabsorbed by the proximal coronary tubule and in lysosome they cause cellular dysfunction and therefore problem with your bicarb absorption. How do you diagnose type 2 RTA? Give them a sodium bicarb load and if your fractional excretion of bicarb is more than 20% you are dealing with proximal RTA. Treatment includes a lot of bicarb supplementation 10 to 15 milliplants per kg per day and since these guys are deficient in citrate as well, give them potassium citrate if they are hypokalemic. In distal RT, you have inability to secrete hydrogen ions in distal convoluted tubule and there are two channels involved, hydrogen ATPase and hydrogen potassium ATPase. The hydrogen ion that is excreted out from these channels can have three fates. First, it can combine with urinary buffers like phosphoric acid. Second, it can combine with ammonia to form ammonium ion and get secreted in urine. Or third, it can combine with the bicarb to form carbonic acid and the CO2 which is formed is used to regenerate bicarb and with this is absorbed in the circulation. If you do not have these two channels, a lot of these processes don't happen and your bicarb is not generated. Since there are no major bicarb absorptive processes after the distal convoluted tubule, except the proximal collecting duct where the aldosterone can help some reabsorption of bicarb, you lose quite a bit of bicarb in the urine. So your urine pH is alkaline and it does not fall below 5.3. You also have a low serum bicarb and this is less than 15. Ammonia that was supposed to combine with the hydrogen ion is now reabsorbed back into the circulation. You also have some degree of trouble making ammonia in proximal convoluted tubule and therefore you have less degree of ammonium excretion in the urine so your urine osmolar gap will be less than 150. You also have problem with potassium loss because of inability to exchange potassium for hydrogen in the DCT. Chronic acidosis results in demineralization of bone and results in hypercalciuria. This is a problem both with proximal and distal RTAs. If you remember in proximal RTA it's a diuretic response and your urinary pH can be more acidic depending upon the amount of bicarb. 
While in distal artery, you do not have the osmotic diuretic response and your urinary pH are much more alkaline. This acts as nidus for forming renal stones. So renal stones are hallmark for distal RTAs. Other clinical features include hypokalemia, urine pH more than 5.3, bicarb less than 15, hypocitrate urea, and urine osmolal gap less than 150. Distal RTA is caused mostly by autoimmune disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, lupus. Towel inhalation due to glue sniffing is one of the cause for distal RTA. Medications such as amphotericin B and ibuprofen are commonly involved. Remember the amphotericin B as medical board is very fond of asking this question. To diagnose type 1 RTA, give them a sodium bicarb load and their fractional excretion of bicarb will be less than 20%. To confirm type 1 RTA, give a ammonium chloride acidification test and your urine pH will not drop below 5.3. Instead of ammonium chloride, you can use Lasix and Fludrocortisone for the same effect. Treatment includes bicarb supplementation, usually lower than seen in type 2 RTAs and this is around 1 to 4 milliequivalents per kg per day. Finally, we have type 4 RTA which is a hyperkalemic RTA. This is the commonest form of RTA and this is seen when your aldosterone does not work effectively. If you remember, aldosterone works in proximal collecting duct and it stimulates sodium potassium pump along with sodium potassium ATPs. It also helps excrete hydrogen ions. So with aldosterone present, you absorb sodium and excrete potassium and water and bicarb follows along with the sodium. If you do not have aldosterone, you do not have efficient pumping of these channels. So your sodium stays in the urine and potassium stays in the capillaries. You are also unable to generate bicarb and you also end up being volume depleted. Therefore, these patients will be hyperkalemic and will have high urine sodium. Second type of hyperkalemic RTA is your voltage dependent RTA. And this happens because if you got a lot of sodium in the distal coronary tubule, it generates negative charge on the intraluminal side and therefore aids both hydrogen and potassium excretion. And hydrogen ion can combine with ammonia to be excreted as ammonium ion. However, if you have reduced sodium presentation to your distal coronary tubule, it reduces your hydrogen and potassium excretion. And this is commonly seen in severe hypovolemia, urinary tract obstruction, and sickle cell disease. Other thing that happens in hyperkalemic RTAs is that hyperkalemia is an inhibitor of ammonia synthesis. So it reduces the amount of ammonia that is secreted in the proximal convoluted tubule. So your urine osmolar gap is pretty low, less than 150. Urinary pH in RTA type 4 is usually less than 5.5 since all the other systems are working well. Think about it as overall low net acid excretion but still able to excrete acid. The reason these guys have metabolic acidosis is because their net acid production is more than the net acid excretion. So how do you diagnose type 4 RTA? It's a hyperkalemic RTA. Check serum renin levels, aldosterone level, and cortisol levels. The results will be even better if you give them a Lasix challenge test prior to testing for these three labs, or patient are in more than three hour in upright position before checking these. If you see reduced aldosterone, look at your renin levels. If you got normal renin and reduced aldosterone, you are dealing with hypoaldosteronism. And this can be from primary or secondary adrenal insufficiency. Medications like heptin can do this as well. If you got reduced renin along with reduced aldosterone, that means you are dealing with problem with renin angiotensin 2 excess. And this would be seen in your diabetic or hypertensive nephropathy or patient on ACE inhibitors. If you have elevated aldosterone, you are either dealing with a voltage-dependent RTA or aldosterone resistance. And we know that voltage-dependent RTA would be seen in severe hypovolemia, urinary tract obstruction, and sickle cell disease. And medications like trimethoprim and spironolactone gives aldosterone resistance. Treatment will include treating the underlying cause and supplementing fludrocortisone if you are dealing with adrenal insufficiency. So suspect renal tubular acidosis when you have an unexplained non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And step one is to look at your potassium. If your potassium is high, you are dealing with hyperkalemic or type 4 RTA. 
If it is low, it can be either type 1 or type 2. If it is type 4, go ahead and check your renin, aldosterone and cortisol level and try to figure out what's causing that. If you have low potassium, do a sodium bicarb load and look at the fractional excretion of bicarb. And if it is more than 20%, you have type 2 RTA. And if it's less than 20%, it's type 1 RTA. And you can confirm type 1 RTA using your ammonium chloride acidification test where your urine pH doesn't drop below 5.3. If you check your urine osmolal gap, since there's a problem in ammonia production in both type 1 and type 4, the urine osmolal gap will be less than 150. While in type 2 RTA, your urine osmolal gap will be more than 150. However, this is not always true because the pH and the ammonia levels in type 2 RTA depend on your bicarb levels. Similarly, if you look at the urine pH, in your type 1 RTA, urine pH will never be as thick. It will be always more than 5.3. And while in type 4 RTA, your urine pH will be less than 5.5. In type 2 RTA, the urine pH will be variable depending on the amount of bicarb that patient has. In type 1 RTA, these are guys with renal stones and type 2 RTA have problems with osmotic diuresis. So this is just a baseline for you. There are a lot of stuff about RTAs and rabbit hole goes really deep. Go through it if you're a nephrologist and if you're interested in this topic. This cartoon to figure out type 1, 2 and 4 RTAs. Type 1 has stones, 2 has osmotic diuresis and 3 has hyperkalemia. Thank you.